You said good singing. I obviously wasn't singing loud enough for you to hear me, which um, is a good thing for everyone. Yeah. Well, that sets me up for the oldest preacher joke ever told. I, I don't sing duets, I only sing solos. Solo, you can't hear me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we draw our attention to the Word of God, if you, you join me for a moment uh, of prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, we are thankful uh, for your holy Word. Uh, we are thankful that we can come into this place and we can freely open up your Word. And we thank you for that. We, we overlook it. I overlook it. This privilege we have to open up our Bibles and hear a word from you. We overlook it. We take it for granted. May we not do that now. With eager ears, may we hear your word. May nothing keep us from hearing your voice. We pray these things uh, in that wonderful name we lifted up in song moments ago. We, we pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. As we get started this evening, I want you to imagine a situation in your own life that you deemed as hopeless. I'll give you a minute to think about that. A situation in your own life that you deemed as hopeless. As that situation comes to mind, perhaps it's a situation from long ago. Or perhaps it was a situation from yesterday. Uh, maybe it was a situation from this morning. I want you to bring that situation to mind because we're about to read a few verses from Ecclesiastes chapter 6. And I can promise you that the situation he describes is even darker. It seems even more hopeless. But I believe that reading these words... And comparing it to some of the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus uh, will not put us further into despair. Um, I firmly believe it will fill us with hope. If you would join me in Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. As you're flipping there ever so quickly... I am going to give you a bit of a recap. Now that we're a number of weeks into our study of Ecclesiastes, uh, we're going to start moving very quickly. We've done great work at looking at some big themes that get repeated numerous times throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. We, we began uh, with a look at vanity, or everything to the preacher was vanity futile or, or meaningless. And as we've discussed many times, hopefully you can follow along with me or you could even repeat this next phrase. This word meaningless that we see 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes and actually has a, a bit more depth than we see on the surface. In, in one sense, it means yeah, life happens quickly. It's here and then it's gone. The Bible describes it. It's a a vapor. It's here and then it's gone. So it definitely means that. But then, uh, second meaning that life's also got a lot of paradox to it. We see a lot of good things and we also see a lot of bad things. Uh, inside of us, we, we desire justice, but we see injustice. All over the place. 
We look at even people and we say, this is a good person, good things should happen to them, and then bad things happen to them. And we look at bad people and we say, bad things should happen to them, and then good things happen to them. This Hebrew word, hevel, that we see translated as vanity, futile, meaningless. The book of Ecclesiastes walks us through that in a number of life situations. That's a big theme. And we also see this big theme of chasing the wind. There's a lot to this life that seems like chasing after the wind. We, we are busy, but we just grow tired. We're, we're left exhausted with nothing to show for it. And with those two understandings, those big themes, we, we can start to move quickly uh, through whole chapters of Ecclesiastes, where through the lens of these two big themes, he will narrow the focus on certain aspects of life. So let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 1. We'll, we'll read the entirety of the chapter. It's just 12 verses. I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor, so they lack nothing their hearts desire. But, but God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man... Uh, may have a hundred children and live many years, and yet no matter how long he lives, he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial. And hear how this verse ends. It says, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning, it departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not all go to the same place? Everyone's toil is for their mouth, and yet their appetite is never satisfied. What advantage have the wise over fools? What do the poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This, too, is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Whatever exists has already been named, and what humanity has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. The more the words, the less the meaning. How does that profit anyone? And finally, for who knows what is good for a person in life? During the few and meaningless days... They pass through like a shadow. Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they are gone? Moments ago, I asked you to bring to mind a, a hopeless situation. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 6 is a... A hopeless situation indeed. When we began this study, I, I mentioned to you that one commentator uh, wrote that the book of Ecclesiastes is the only book of the Bible written on a Monday morning. I, I, I think Ecclesiastes chapter 6 was written in a season of Monday mornings, right? He woke up and it was Monday morning. He lived a terrible day and he woke up and it was Monday morning again. And then he lived a terrible day and he woke up and it was Monday morning again. And then he sits down at night and he writes Ecclesiastes chapter 6. It's a season of Monday mornings. I realize it. That, that was a strange chapter we just read, so I, I do want to help you out a bit. When, when I was in high school and when I was in college, kids were 
always trying to do less work than the work that was actually assigned. Um, and, and people soon figure out that they could make a lot of money with kids trying to do less work than work was assigned. And in one ways, these high school and college students did less work than the work that was assigned because they would find these things called Cliff's Notes. Right? You might have been assigned a, a thousand-page novel, and you could go to the bookstore and you could buy Cliff's Notes, which takes a thousand-page novel and reduces it to like 40 pages and gives you all that you need in terms of plot and themes and characters. And Some people are brave enough just to not read the book, uh, take the Cliff Notes and feel like they could do a pretty good job passing an exam. Of course, I want you reading the scripture, uh, but for tonight, I'm going to give you Cliff's Notes on Ecclesiastes chapter 6. If you're in the room tonight, I've taken this chapter and I've reduced it uh, to, to three passages. One's an entire verse, uh, and two of them are only portions of a verse. So we've taken all of Ecclesiastes chapter 6, and we can pull the big message out with just a few select readings. It begins... Uh, this Cliff's Notes version of Ecclesiastes chapter 6 with a reference to verse 3. Where we're told a man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, he cannot enjoy his property and does not receive proper burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. That's a season of Monday mornings. That's a, a hopeless situation. And that verse alone really unpacks some of these major themes. This is a description of heaven. This is a description of life being meaningless, futile, vanity. This verse unpacks this meaning of life's just a chasing after the wind. You can, you can gain possessions and wealth and honor and even children. And for most of your life, you're not even going to enjoy it. You're going to work hard to get it. And then you're going to work hard to keep it nice. And you're going to work hard to maintain it. You never even get to enjoy it. And then he says there's a good chance that when you die, even if you've got all these kids, they're not going to care <laughs> when you're dead. They won't even give you a proper burial. Which could mean a couple of things in context. It likely means perhaps you grow old and your kids grow up and you're just not around them when you die. Or... They just don't care to give you the proper burial. Spent all my life caring for things and for people, all meaningless. Spent all my life doing all these things, and it was all the chasing after the wind. And then to drive that nail even further... The preacher says, uh, wouldn't a stillborn child be better off? Unpacking that, he says, uh, the one that dies young never had to experience all this pain. And the one that died young never had to go through all these struggles. Isn't that better? Hopefully that makes us a bit uncomfortable right now. Right? Hopefully you, you lean into that and you go, well, what's going on here? Thankfully, we've got a Cliff Notes version. We could, we could move to Ecclesiastes 6, 6b, just a, not even the entire verse. The preacher asks the question, do not all go to the same place? Now that's a serious question. Here's a man that 
lived a long time, gained a lot of things, possessed a lot of things, had lots of children, and then he died. And then here's a stillborn child who, who died and didn't do anything, didn't gain anything, didn't possess anything. Don't they all go to the same place? Or wouldn't you rather just avoid all the suffering? Again, that should make us feel uncomfortable. <laughs> we should lean in and say, well, what's going on here? It takes us to Ecclesiastes 6.12b. He asked another question. He said, who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they are gone? And here I, I firmly believe that this is written in a way, if I could picture the preacher writing this, after he's contemplated this for a minute, he throws his hands up in disgust. And said, why even bother? What's it all matter? And I realize it is unlikely that anybody in this room or tuned into this broadcast, I, I think it's unlikely that we've used such vivid imagery. And I, I admit, I, I do think, and I, you've heard me say this before, I, I do think the preacher is giving us an honest look at life, unfiltered. And he doesn't care how we receive it. He doesn't care what we feel about it. He doesn't try to sugarcoat it or make it sound nice or put it on a pretty platter or put a nice bow around it. He's experienced things in life and he's given you his hard lessons learned. And he's asking the question, why does it matter? Why bother? Now again, I don't think we've used these terms, but I think we've been in that situation. We've been in those situations in life where it just seems meaningless. It seems like a chasing after the wind. And we go, why do I have to go through this? Why does it matter? Because the preacher's describing a hopeless situation. And specifically, he's talking about a hopeless situation when it comes to death. He's describing death as a great equalizer. Nobody defeats death. Death is undefeated. We all die. So he's asking the question, why does it matter how we live? Why does it matter if I live a long time or a short time? We're all going to die. Why should I do good or bad? Why should I do this or that? We're all going to die and we're all going to go to the same place, right? And the ends it. Who can tell me what happens after we're here? We're done here. What happens? And the question is left hanging there in Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Again, we we're thinking about our own hopeless situation, whether it was seasons ago or it was yesterday, whether it was seasons ago or it was this morning. Perhaps you've asked similar questions. Why does it matter? What difference does it make? What if I do this or what, do I, what if I do that? This seems like a hopeless situation. As I said from the outset, and as you've seen the last few weeks, I want us to read through these passages of Ecclesiastes. I want us to place ourselves into the text, but, but then I want us to study it with Jesus as our guide. I want us to read this with Jesus standing over our shoulder. Now, I realize we stopped it at a very tense place, but sometimes our life doesn't have nice beginnings and endings. And as we've already discussed, our seasons of life, we don't know when they start and we don't know when they end. So let's just take chapter 6 and let's deal with what's been said. Jesus reading over our shoulder, Jesus as our guide. What would Jesus say to a person saying, 
What does it matter? Why bother? What would Jesus say to a person saying, doesn't everybody just go to the same place? What would Jesus offer to the person asking the question, well, who can tell what will happen under the sun after they're gone? Ecclesiastes chapter 6 is describing life as a few meaningless days. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Life is just a few meaningless days. And then you die. (laughs) Hope denied, hope rejected, hope stamped void. What would Jesus say to that? I I think we have a couple of passages that would help us. If you would turn with me to John 14. We'll read another six verses here. John 14. If you're still with me, can I hear an amen? Um. I promise you there's some good news coming. You read Ecclesiastes chapter 6, and I feel like here on a Wednesday night, I've brought you to a Monday morning, right? Uh, but, but I promise we have some good news coming our way. John 14, 1 through 6. What, what would Jesus say? John 14, verse 1. Jesus speaking here. He says, Do not let your hearts... Be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And then verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Ecclesiastes paints a picture of life, but life with no hope. But as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we view life from a different perspective. Our our view on life is not denied hope. Hope is not rejected. Hope is not stamped void. These short six verses paint a different picture. It provides a different perspective. Perspective, And I, I have to tell you this, just out front, get it out there. Um, Ecclesiastes 6 is talking about death. Uh, John 14, 1 through 6 is my go-to funeral passage. If you've been to a funeral that I've preached, you've likely heard me discuss John 14, 1 through 6. If I happen to preach your funeral... Very likely that I will use John 14, 1 through 6. Because it describes hope. It describes how a Christian should view life and life after death. I love the passage Jesus is talking about to his disciples about his coming departure. And he tells them, don't let your hearts be troubled. What I love about that is that as humans, nothing gets under our skin more than someone telling us not to be troubled when we're troubled. 
Right? We don't like when someone tells us uh, when we're worried, oh, don't worry. Uh, we don't like when we're panicked for someone to tell us, oh, just calm down. Jesus looks at his disciples and he knows they're troubled and he says, don't be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. I like that phrase because uh, many of us have heart trouble. No, it's not a medical condition. Uh, we let the things of life cause us heart trouble. The workplace, family life, unrealized dreams, finances cause us heart trouble. And Jesus says, you know what's good for heart trouble? Hope. Hope is a good cure for heart trouble. So Jesus looks at him and says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Now when another human says to that to us, we, we deem them insensitive. But Jesus wasn't being insensitive. Uh, he's got a bigger, a, a broader hope-filled perspective. He, he knows that as he departs, uh, he's going to the side of the heavenly Father, where this passage paints this picture of him preparing a place. And that there's going to come a day that he brings us to join him at this place that he has prepared for us. By his side, as he's by the side of the Heavenly Father. He wasn't being insensitive. He was describing hope. He, he was describing how a Christian should view not only this life, but life after death. In verse 4, Jesus says, going to prepare a place for you. It's going to be a place that I've prepared for you, and it's going to be by my side, and I'm going to be the, by the side of the Heavenly Father. And, of course, you guys know how to get there. You've got the address plugged into your iPhones. You know how to get there. And then Thomas kind of looks around the way I read this. Yeah, it's not in the passage, it's just the way I like to view it. Jesus says, you know the way that I'm going. And Jesus, P Thomas says, Peter, you know what he's talking about? Any of you guys know? Wait. Jesus, I'm lost here, right? I don't know if I missed this sermon, right? Didn't know if I was out buying supplies while you went over this. Um, don't know if I was just reading the Cliff Notes version of this sermon, but, but I missed the directions, I don't know what time we're supposed to show up at the bus station. I, I, I don't know. Thomas asked the question we all want to ask. He says, where is this place? How, how can we know the way? And Jesus answers very clearly. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus looks at people with heart trouble. People facing a hopeless situation. So don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in me. For I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Ecclesiastes asked the question, doesn't everybody go to the same place? Jesus says, everybody dies, that's for sure. But I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Thank God for hope. And thank God for the hope of eternal life. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that that's, that's my go-to funeral passage. But I mention that because I'm in front of this audience, right? That's, that's my go-to funeral passage. When, when I know the person that we are memorializing was a believer. 
And, and I know that I've got the good, fine church folk in the audience in front of me. Because we know the truths of that passage. We, we know that person is in the presence of the Lord. And, and we can look at a passage like this and have the hope of knowing that that person is in the presence of the Lord. And, and one day we will join them in the presence of the Lord. I go to a different passage when I'm preaching a, a funeral uh, in front of a different audience. When I'm in front of a different audience, I go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you would join me there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Um, I'll help you find that a bit. I like to do this when I can. Uh, you've heard me talk about God eats popcorn, right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, and then just know that after God eats popcorn, there's a bunch of the letters that start with T. Right, so you're going to get 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. God eats popcorn, the T letters. Helps you navigate around the New Testament a bit. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you're still with me, can I hear a big loud amen? We've, we've hopefully lifted the mood a little bit. Ecclesiastes chapter 6 saying... Ugh. Life is hopeless. You, you could gain a lot of stuff and have lots of kids and you're still going to die and nobody's going to even bury you the way you want to be buried. And then when we die, don't we all go to the same place? And who knows what's going to happen to everybody else and what's going to happen to us once we die? Jesus says, hold on a minute. There's something more going on here. For the believer, we live with hope, this hope of eternal life. I'm going, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and there's going to come a day when you are going to be with me. Let's turn our attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Now, I'll admit, I'm going to glance at my watch here. I, I would love, this is one passage that I think many people know, but they don't really know. And I'd love to give an hour to it tonight, but I won't. But, but I, I hope we walk out of here really uh, with a, f a firmer grip on this passage. First Thessalonians 4 verse 13, uh, the apostle Paul talking to the church in Thessalonica. He says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Let's just pause there for a moment. I see Apostle Paul saying, I, I don't want you to be uninformed. Some translations put ignorant. Because I'm teaching this to you. I'm describing this. Because I don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant about what happens to people when they die. That should perk our ears up. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Let me catch this. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind or like the rest of the world who have no hope. Let's pause there for just a moment. Ecclesiastes is talking about death. Everybody dies. Death is the great equalizer. And doesn't everybody go to the same place? This is all meaningless. It's chasing after the wind. It's hopeless. And then here's the Apostle Paul saying, now things happen when people die. And when people die, non-believers, the non-Christians, will grieve But they'll grieve with no hope. Because death is the great equalizer. He says, but, but Christians, we grieve. Yes. But we grieve with hope. 
Hopefully we're leaning in there. Verse 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we will tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Again, this is a passage we know, but we don't really know. And I I don't have the time to unpack this all. But Apostle Paul's talking about that for the believer, um, they die. And we talk about other passages we could bring in here. And we know that when, when we die, we are in the presence of the Lord Right? To, to die is to be with Christ. We see this language throughout the New Testament. Uh, and then other New Testament passages, we, talk, we, we learn about there'll, there'll come a day when Jesus calls this all to an end. And Christ will return. And it's at that time that the believers will receive resurrection bodies. And heaven and earth will become one. I don't want you to be ignorant. To die is to be in the presence of the Lord. And now that you know these things, encourage one another. I read this passage and... um, especially when I read it on on the heels of reading Ecclesiastes chapter 6. And and three things bring me comfort. If you've got a handout in in front of you, I have these outlined for you. I don't even make you fill in a blank. They're right there. Three three things from this passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 provide me comfort. One, believers have hope. Rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So, people die. And the world in facing death will grieve, but grieve without hope. In facing death, believers grieve, but they grieve with hope. And we have that hope rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus. If you read back first through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, our hopeful view of the future is not based on wishful thinking or wild speculation. He says we can look to the future with hope because we can look backwards and see that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Right, we can look forward with hope. We can look forward with a hope of eternal life because we can look back and know that Jesus defeated sin and death and the cross and the empty tomb. We can look forward with hope. We can look forward with the hope of eternal life because we can look backwards and know that we, had, we have united with Jesus in his death and his resurrection. This is what... The New Testament describes. This is what those early disciples witnessed. This is what the early church witnessed and recorded for us. This is what the early church witnessed and preached. And it's what the church has been proclaiming ever since. We have hope. It's not rooted in wishful thinking or wild speculation. 
It's rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Two, believers have hope rooted in death as a transition into the presence of Jesus. In view of the resurrection, believers don't see death as the end of life. And believers view death as the transition into the presence of our Lord. Now, this doesn't minimize death. Uh, death hurts. Uh, death causes pain and heartache. That's why the passage mentions grieving. But believers, we grieve with hope. We can grieve and answer Ecclesiastes chapter 6. No, death's not the great equalizer. For the believer, death is a transition into the presence of Jesus. Christians don't grieve like the rest of the world. We, we grieve with a hope, a, a hope that is rooted in death as a transition into the presence of Jesus. And three, the third thing that comforts me from this passage, believers have a hope of the future that determines how we live now. I love the ending of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. He says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Says, now that you know this, right, you're no longer uninformed. You're no longer ignorant. Now that you know the truth, this hope rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus, this, this hope that, that is rooted in death as a transition into the presence of Jesus. Now that you know this, encourage one another with these words. That affects how we live now. If we encounter a person or we encounter days when we're viewing life through an Ecclesiastes chapter 6 perspective. When we're saying, why, why does it matter? Why bother? When we're wanting to throw our hands up in disgust. We should remember, oh, it, we don't live life like the rest of the world. We don't grieve like the rest of the world. We have hope. But the, the challenge that death does present to the believer is that we must live out our faith on difficult days. Really easy for us to have that conversation in here right now. Much more difficult. Um, when we're on the receiving end of the phone call. When we're, we're making our way up the elevator at the hospital. A completely different scenario when we're facing that hopeless situation right in the eye. That's why we have to grab a hold of these truths right now. And encourage one another with them. Because there will be a day when we need to have our eyes open to hope once again. I said earlier, Ecclesiastes chapter 6, written on a Monday morning. I think it was written on a Monday morning while the preacher was all alone. He was 
off in, in one of his many mansions. And though he could have been surrounded with many different people, he wasn't. Life was kicking him in the teeth. It was a Monday morning and he was all alone. Why does it matter? He needed some hope. As Christians, as believers in Jesus, that hope is readily available to us. You need to grab it tonight. Grab it. And then once you have it, don't hoard it. Don't keep it to yourself. But encourage one another with this truth. At the very beginning of our time together this evening, I, I wanted you to think about that hopeless situation. Whether it was seasons ago or that hopeless situation was yesterday. Whether that was seasons ago or that hopeless situation was this morning. I, I, I want you to hear Jesus' words from the beginning of that passage from John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus would say to you, trust in me. Don't let your heart be troubled, but trust in God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, I, I lift up to you uh, every person uh, in this chapel. I lift up to you every person tuned into this broadcast. And Father, I know some people will tune into this broadcast weeks from now, months from now. Whoever is hearing my voice, may we cling to hope. A hope rooted not in wishful thinking or wild speculation. May we grab a hold of the hope given to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. May that provide us deep, lasting comfort. And Father, I know that there's people in this room and people tuned into this broadcast in desperate need of hope and comfort right now. Father, I pray that in your grace and in your power, you would break through all the pain, the heartache, and the heartbreak And that you would provide healing to the soul. Father, we confess our, our weakness. Uh, our, our absolute dependence upon you. Father, we, we do so well at pretending and faking and putting one foot in the front of another. But we need you. We bow our lives before you right now. We give it all. We ask for your will to be done. We, we ask you to sit and remain on your throne. We know that you never leave your throne, but we, we try to pretend that we sit upon it or other things are in control. But Father, we know you, it, it's your throne. May your will be done. May your kingdom come here. May we stop fighting and resisting. May we cling to hope. And, and may that make us joyful people. May that make us people who are quick to share the good news. May that make us quick to speak life into situations. May we encourage our family Encourage our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. May you use us to bring hope to others. 
Father, as we gather here tonight, we, we pray for our church, uh, from our nursery to our senior adults. May we cling to the hope that we have in Jesus. May we be a church of committed followers of Jesus Christ. May we preach the gospel from every pulpit, every Bible study classroom, every living room, and every bedside table. Father, we lift up those in our church tonight in need of physical healing. You call us as, as the church to pray for those who are sick. And Father, there's, there's many in our church who are sick. And we pray your healing upon them. Whether they're in a, a, a rehab center or a hospital room or a, a, a nursing home. Whether they're at home recovering from surgery or... At, at home headed to surgery father we we pray that wherever they are they would feel your presence we pray philippians 4 over them that you would take their fear and worry and anxiety and that you would replace it with the peace that transcends all understanding father we we pray um, Seems like we've been praying this for a long time, but we have no control, so we come to you, the one with the power. We, we pray for this uh, pandemic, this virus thing, to whatever it is, whatever we need to call it, Father, we pray that in your grace you'd bring it to an end. I, I ask that because I, I know that you can. Uh, so, so I ask that you would. And humbly, <laughs> I, I lead on you. I, I ask that you would because I know you can. Father, we pray uh, from our country, for our country, from, from the, the local level uh, all the way up. Uh, Father, we pray that we would have leaders in positions um, that seek you. If they don't seek you, Father, we pray that you would surround them with people that will give them good and godly advice and wisdom and direction. Uh, Father, if things are not as they should be, and we know that that is the case in many, many, many situations, if things are not the way they should be, Father, bring rebuke, bring correction. And Father, where things honor you, uh, may they be supported and encouraged. And Father, there's so much to pray for. Um, so much. Um, that needs to reflect you so much. Um, just there's so much, and Father, we we lean on a passage like um, Romans eight that when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. We give you our lives. We give you our church. Uh, we give you everything, and we pray these things. So thankful that our prayers don't hit the ceiling and fall back to the floor. And we pray these things confident that as we pray, our prayers enter your throne room and you hear the cries of your people. We thank you for that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.